The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to talk about perennials in your garden, as well as container gardening 101, as well as a special segment, cooking in cast iron. And we'll answer your garden questions. The hour is full, so join us. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. And welcome to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Happy you are taking time out of your day to join us on the program. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, and preserving what you grow. We thank you for taking time and listening to us on one of the 20 AM and FM frequencies broadcasting our program here in 2023 through a radio app, through a podcast replay, in-studio video replay, or through our parent website. You may be capturing the program, which is the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com underneath the Season 7 tab at the top of the page. We thank you for that. If you want to be part of the program, you can certainly do that by sending us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Or you can give us a call toll-free, coast-to-coast. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. 1-800-927-7469. You can give us a call now or anytime and leave a message and we will get back to you with the answer to the question in which you are pondering. So, Holly, Let's get into the program and talk about perennials for the garden. These can be flowers and or edible things that come back year after year. Right. So there's a lot of perennial plants and some some common, I'm talking about non-edibles, some common ones are things like um, hostas. Daffodils. Daffodils. So those are, those are bulbs. Yes. Yeah, but um, hostas are, are a huge one. A lot of people like those. Daylilies. Daylilies, yep. Um, uh, t- tulips. Did you say tulip? No, you said I didn't daffodils. say tulip. I said daffodil. Um, and then also there's clematis. There's coreopsis. So, and typically if you go to a garden center, there is going to be an area for perennials and then annuals. And then edibles, and- edibles. Yep. So if you're ever like, I don't know what I want. If you go to your independent garden center, they can help you. You just say, hey, I'm new at this. Can you help me? And they will be more than happy to direct you and advise you on, okay, where are you wanting to plant this? Well, that, that wouldn't be good for that area. This would be a better. They will walk you through. Right. A good independent garden center will walk you through because they care about you. Other places, not so much. And they'll, they'll help you find something that will work for your growing zone yes. as opposed to and, and they maybe would, a big back store that wouldn't. And they typically, an independent garden center in your region, Denver, uh, 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 you know, uh, Kansas City, Boston, they will have plants that are specifically for that area. One of our local garden centers even has um, native, native mm-hmm. species. So definitely we encourage you to check that out. As far as vegetables slash edibles, there's... There's uh, quite a few, and most people in the United States can grow them. Right. We'll start with strawberries. We would recommend getting, there's June bearing and ever bearing. We talked about this in the program a couple of weeks ago. You can get these, and if you're going to plant them, I would recommend planting them in the ground in a very good location, full sun, because if you try to plant them in a container, yeah, you are probably going to get berries, but you're going to nurse that plant, have to water it very frequently in hot days. You're going to do a lot of work for three, four weeks of berries, and you got to keep it alive the other 26 to 28 before it goes in dormancy. In the ground, a lot less work. And they will come back five to seven years is the uh, average lifespan of strawberry plants. And there's some ways you can do cages over them to keep the birds or, or other, other things from eating them. Uh, and uh, slugs are a problem, but that we're talking about just the plants themselves. Uh, problems are for another program. And uh, strawberries, they, they do good in most soil. Right. Um, strawberries are, are fun to grow. And I think, especially if you have kids or grandchildren, they're fun to grow. I remember when we had a strawberry patch, 
our niece and nephew really enjoyed getting the strawberries directly from from the patch. Uh, and now, our niece could not eat store bought strawberries. She would break out. Yeah. She eat the strawberries out of the garden. No problem at all. Yeah, I forgot. Food about for that. thought. Yeah, definitely. Berry plants. Yeah, berry plants. So this includes anything from like raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, um, elderberries, elderberries. There's a lot of different berry plants. Some of them are like just good to go. Put them in the soil. Blah blah blah. Some like blueberries want a higher, a lower acidity, a lower lower acidity soil. So you want to do your research on that. And then also, a lot of times, rabbits will eat your berry plants, so you might want to put up a little cage around them. Deer defeat. Uh, yeah. Deer defeat. Oh, yeah, deer defeat. Yep. Uh, deer defeat. They have an all-natural uh, deer, rabbit, and groundhog uh, spray. Non-toxic, environmentally friendly, and it will last through rain, sleet, and snow. Use coupon code RADIO to save 10% on your order when you go to deerdefeat.com. Rabbits are a big problem there. Some people choose other means to eradicate them, but if you are one that can't or chooses not to, Deer to Feed is a good alternative to keep them away from keep them from eating what you're growing. So yeah, berry plants, and there's maintenances that you got to do with berry plants uh, based on how how many you've got and, and everything, and keeping them healthy and happy. But uh, berry plants, uh, a very easy plant to grow. Get started, and it will take care of itself. Now, raspberries, we are finding, we've got golden raspberries. We are finding that they have runners, which we knew this, but we never really planned for this. So we've got runners of free raspberry plants kind of coming up in a few places in the garden, which not a bad thing. Not at all. Asparagus, Holly. Aspar- or, or you got something about berry plants? No, it's just uh, okay. excited for asparagus. Asparagus, okay. So we finally, in tw- I think in 2020, right? Yep. We decided to grow asparagus or start it because it takes a few years to become a, a patch. Establ- a crop, established. established. Asparagus. And so we bought our asparagus crowns from our local garden center. And we can harvest we, everything this year. Right. So we, but here's the words to the wise. Yes. We put them in the ground and they didn't do anything. They didn't take, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. And they didn't come out of dormancy. No. They, they were dead. So then we called the garden center and we said, can we return these? And they were like, just give it another week or whatever. And we we're like, we, it's not, no, that's, that's not the case. It's a week isn't going to make a difference. And so they let us return them and then we got them from another garden center thing. But um, they, you, when you plant them, you want to make sure you spread the roots out. You'll have these roots that are like. Um, like giant spider legs. Yeah, like spider legs. And then get them established. And then the f- so the first year they're they're planted. The second year you'll have some asparagus fronds. Is that what they're called? Fears. 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 Now, and now that's if you've planted a one year or a two year. There's different years of crowns in which you can purchase. Two yeah. would be recommended, but they get they're more costly. Right. So then we just we just trimmed them. Did we trim them back? Yeah. Uh, we we did trim a few. We, we left everything alone the first year. Last year we had like we harvested very few. We have the green kind. I forget if it's Martha Mary, Washington. Mary Washington. Mary, and there's also purple or burgundy color that we uh, we don't grow. And then the white is whenever you bury them. The the Asians um, use that. They grow the asparagus. They cover it. They bleach it out and they harvest it white. So yeah, I mean, bleach. Yeah. So anyway, um, you so that now we should be able to harvest. Correct. We can harvest everything that comes up this year. Fruit trees are another wonderful aspect in which you plant once. It's an investment. Could cost a couple of, you know, dozen dollars. Uh, but it's going to be there for pretty much as long as you're around if if, ba- if, if things bad don't happen. It, you know, if you don't cut it down or damage it. Uh, fruit trees, a lot of fruit trees can grow in places in which you don't think they can. Uh, fig trees, there's a many varieties in which are cold hardy. Peach trees, there are varieties in which can grow in zone four, and there are certain ones can only grow in like Georgia. So if you want fruit trees, there is a very high probability in which you could get the specific type of fruit tree in which you want on your property. You just have to source it from the right place. So keep that in mind. Now, if you don't want to do that or don't have the available real estate in order to grow fruit trees, there are many dwarf variety options in which you can buy. And from pomegranate to orange to lime to lemon, 
that you can grow in your house. We have done that. The only downside to growing them in your house is two things. One, you have to pollinate with a Q-tip as they flower. They can take about three years to get to a flowering state because you buy them and they're a little stick, as well as they can harbor diseases it appears to us much more easily such as scale um than if they were outside right and we had so we had a, a dwarf orange a lime, uh, tree? lime tree initially yeah. Yeah. yeah and they were like little i think they were like in the key lime variety mm-hmm. and they were it was cute it was fun to have we got on clearance for something and then it got scale and the scale basically killed it and then now we got this orange tree from our local garden center. And did we buy that in 2020? Yes. I think. Um, and now it's finally flowering. But it has scale. It has some scale. So we'll see what happens if we'll... It's it's okay. It seems to be doing decently. Yeah. But we'll see what happens. Another thing is those those flowers stink. Uh-huh. They're very yeah. potent flower. Yes. It smells like, like burning rubber. <laughs> it, it does. It's terrible. Um, another thing in which you can do that's low profile, many people say it's, it's invasive. However, we have not found that to be the case, which is Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes. And you can also grow these in containers as well to control if you're concerned with them. They are a root crop that has a low level of starch in them that can return year after year. A typical plant will produce three to eight pounds based on the fertility of your soil. And they can get up to... 10 to 16 foot tall and bare small daisy-like flowers. They are related to the sunflower plant, and these will grow for a long time. We have the white variety. There is a burgundy variety in which you can also source, and you can get them I was, uh, online right now. Uh, Marketplace, Facebook Marketplace has them. Macari has uh, sellers that are producing them. And you just kind of have to see what they have available and what you feel comfortable paying. And you can have them. And it's a buy once and never have to buy again type of plant. Uh, We find that if you clean the roots off and peel them and then put them in chips, cut them in chip size, as well as then coat them with an olive oil. You can air fry them and make like potato chips with them. You can put them in stews, soups, stir fries. You have to let them cook down in a roast. A roast, uh, you can eat them raw too. Uh, very unique, but very earthy taste. Definitely. If you want to get rid of 90% of the earthy taste, you peel them first. As difficult as they, they are to peel. Because they're kind of knobby. Yeah, very well worth the effort to peel them in order to get the nutrition of them but not the earthy taste that a lot of the skin holds right so speaking of earthy yes um (laughs) well kind of we are brought to you today by walton's inc we know you care about where your food comes from canning preserving your fruits and vegetables from the earth um is great but what about the meat at walton's you can get all the equipment seasoning supplies to make sausage jerky and any other meat product your way they also have um Different seasonings, different spices, spice mixes. I just made a roast the other day, and I used their steak and roast uh, spice rub thing. Uh It was quite delicious. And then they also have meat grinders, mixers, sausage stuffers to help you go from animal to edible. And they also have an informational website called meatgistics.com to help you make the best finished product. Walton's Everything But The Meat, that's waltonsinc.com. You can use code GROW50 to save 10% off of orders of $50 or more. When we come back, it's going, about, about, it's going to be about Container Gardening 101. You're listening to the Gardening with Join Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. Grip6 produces American-made products with sleek designs and quality materials. Based and manufactured in Utah, they have high-quality and durable products to last a lifetime. They are built beyond tough. The wallets are low-profile, made out of high-quality aluminum and options to upgrade. Access your cards and cash without bulk. Guaranteed to last a lifetime, it's the last wallet you'll ever need. Your traditional wallet is big and bulky and not easy to access the cards you need conveniently. Grip6 has a quick array access for your cards. You can also add money bands for cash, more cards, business cards, and more. Variable capacity for minimalist or maximalist. 
lightweight, sleek, and no wallet bulk in your pocket while gardening, working outside, or enjoying the great outdoors. Designed and manufactured in-house for best results and quality every time. When you purchase from Grip6, you're supporting long life cycle products and American-made manufacturing. Check out their belts, wallets, and socks at Grip6.com. Use code RADIO15 to save 15% off at Grip6.com. Dripping Springs Oyas. Clay pot irrigation solves the watering needs for gardens, bushes, new trees, and more. An ancient irrigation system we brought to America. Dripping Springs Oyas. O-L-L-A-S. On YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Check us out. Tree Hugger Sprinklers are the ultimate watering device for either your newly planted or established trees and shrubs. Our sprinklers open and close around the trunk of your tree and provide 360 degrees of watering. With our adjustable valve, you can direct the water to your tree's targeted saturation zone. They come in three sizes, 7, 11, and 15 inches. You can purchase a Tree Hugger Sprinkler at your local garden center, feed store, or hardware store. Go to treehuggersprinklers.com to find a retailer close to you. Or you can buy it directly from Amazon or treehuggersprinklers.com. If you're an independent nursery, garden center, hardware store, or feed store, you will want to stock this product. Contact the good people at Tree Hugger Sprinklers and they will get you set up. Your tree's best friend. TreeHuggerSprinklers.com Twin River Chimes creates a symphony in any space. Chimes that are inspired by nature and designed to make the natural world even more inspiring. Music speaks to everyone. Individually handcrafted in Virginia for over 35 years and hand-tuned for an exceptional precision and lasting beauty. Because in life, the winds of change are always moving. But no matter where they carry you, Wind River Chimes will always be the inspiring harmony. With a large selection and customization options, you will find the sound that soothes you. Visit windriverchimes.com to shop and find out more. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit proplugger.com. Rootmaker starts your plants off right and keeps them going through harvest. From their seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots to their large variety of grow bags, 1 to 60 gallons. Their products will provide you the harvest you've never seen before. Visit rootmaker.com and use coupon code RADIO23 to save 15% off your order at rootmaker.com. Chapin has the tools for planting your garden and keeping it growing all season long. Whether your garden is big or small, Chapin has sprayers and spreaders for fertilizing, weed, and pest control, watering, and seeding. You can find Chapin products at your local hardware store, big box retailer. You may visit them also online at ChapinMFG.com to learn more and buy online. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Root Maker, Jung Seeds, Tree Hugger Sprinklers, Verlo Mattresses, Farmer's Defense, Pomona Universal Pectin, Natural Green Products, Mantis Tillers. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly Radio Show. We're going to talk about Containers 101, but first, a word from Farmer's Defense. Farmer's Defense. Farming garden is ultimate comfort. Farmer's Defense has lightweight and durable sleeves made to protect you against the element while farming. Farmer's sleeves offer an unparalleled protection of arms and skin for any farmer, gardener, or outdoor worker. Say goodbye to irritated skin and sunburns in the garden. Their sleeves offer cooling comfort and protection against the elements outdoors and alternative to thick clothing. Farmer's Defense is made of wicking material with UBF protection factor 50 plus to protect you from allergens and scratches. You can find all their great products and more at FarmersDefense.com. Container gardening is not just something that, uh, uh, well, it's a very universal uh, aspect of gardening that people who have the availability and land to grow uh, choose also to grow in containers, but there are some that just strictly grow in containers because of limitations or restrictions in which they are currently going through. So container gardening, there is some goods and bads and pros and cons and things you should do and things you shouldn't do, and we're going to try to get through as many of that as we can in this segment. Absolutely. So one thing with container gardening is thinking about what you want to grow in and now you might think well i can just grow whatever and maybe that might be the case for you where you want to just 
start, you want to make, grow in five gallon buckets or reuse milk jugs or whatever for certain things. But some people I know they like to have a certain look or aesthetic. So that's something that they want to consider. Maybe they want to invest in some terracotta pots to line their driveway or uh, they R- went root to maker the, grow bags. Yeah. Root maker grow bags. They went to the local garden center and felt inspired by something. So what we can talk more about container sizes, but the biggest thing is making sure you have drainage. You could spend $50 on a beautiful handmade clay pot made by the local artisan lady at the craft fair. But if you don't have drainage holes, you got a swamp you and a things swamp. are dead. Yeah. Um, so just so you know, you can use for root maker. So I had mentioned briefly, you can use rootmaker.com. Go enter code radio 23. You can save 15% off your order. They have uh, grow bags with white coating uh, from one to 60 gallon and uh, grow ba- uh, raised beds, uh, portable raised beds as well. Let me ask you quick. Yeah. So say I did buy this pot for fifty dollars from the the artisan lady, yeah, and or whoever, and I want to put a root maker grow bag in there. Can I do that? You would still need drainage because okay. you can put a root maker grow bag in a container that doesn't have drainage. But when you water or it rains, it's going to pull up in the bottom and eventually come up into the grow bag and turn the grow bag into a a mess. So. If you don't have drainage holes in that particular type of material, you would want to get a masonry bed or have somebody drill holes safely and uh, maybe um, so hidden in the in the device in which you can get the drainage so you can put something inside of it. Well, you could just do it on the bottom or something. Correct. Yeah. So when it comes to uh, grow bags or containers, again, Whatever you're growing in, keep this in mind. The less the amount of soil, the quicker it's going to dry out, the faster the plant will die if you don't water. So a five-gallon bucket is going to dry out a lot quicker than a one-gallon grow bag or a milk jug. So keep that in mind. And all plants, regardless whether you're growing pumpkins or uh, tomatoes or peppers or lettuce, they all need moisture. Some may need more than others. However, keeping that moisture, whether... In, by manual means of a watering can or you get a drip system from uh, dripworks.com or for your tomato you use a tree diaper or or whatever the device is in order to keep the moisture to the plant because all this work that you've put into it there is an investment time there is a process and time in which you've put into it uh, you want it to grow and you want to make sure that these containers are located in the proper area too Right. So a lot of people will sometimes use containers to establish, um, to enhance a landscape, or they will use it because they don't have a good place to grow. Mobility. In the ground. Yeah, or mobility. But maybe they're like, my my backyard faces north. I don't really want to use my front yard, so I'm going to put these containers on the south side of my house. That's always an option. Also, maybe you want them on your porch or something because Mm -hmm. you don't want to have to go out to the side of your house to to handle those containers or you you rent or you're in some type of association where you can't put things in the ground um and so you containers are the only option right so with pleasing aesthetic uh, containers you could do a lot in a very small space absolutely so you want to think about where you want to put it and then also think about okay once i put this here and put the soil in there yeah there you go do it, I, do it that way do it that I, way <laughs> Yeah. Put the container where you want it, yeah. then put the soil in. Because a container gets very, very heavy with wet soil, compost or potting mix, and let's make this thing easy and not difficult it up. And you may have a very strong husband. I don't can, want to lift it if lift, we don't have to. Who, who can lift all the things, but he might not want yeah, to let, lift let's, it. Let's not yeah. lift things we don't need to lift. Right. So, and you might be very strong yourself, like some yeah. of us. So... Um, yeah, you want to think about where you're going to put it, then you put your potting soil or your compost. So let's talk about yes. that potting soil versus compost versus uh, container mix, whatever. Slow release, something, we, you, we've we grown in all 100% compost, we've grown in potting mix or container mix. You want to look, if you're going to go with a container mix, you want to look for something that has a slow release fertilizer. Even though it has a slow release fertilizer, you also want something to have some kind of moisture retention mechanism in it, whether it's verlite or vermiculite. Those add air in it, but also they can hold some moisture as well. Some containers have, or some potting soil mixes have, 
added things in which they absorb and release the moisture as the soil needs. Just because it has a fertilizer in the compost or fertilizer in the potting soil doesn't mean that you never have to fertilize again. Containers are one of those, keep this note here, because containers need to be fertilized very frequently because of the water that is leaching out that nutrients from the soil. In the ground, you don't have that problem as much because you got the ground. You got nutrients coming in and going out and worms and insects and all that moving stuff around. In a container, you don't have that. So you will have to either compost tea or uh, organic fertilizer, liquid or granular, something of that magnitude in order to continue to feed your plant. If you do in complete compost, I would still recommend a feeding regimen because there is that leaching. When you water there and you water the container good, you're going to see the color of the water change as it drains out the bottom. That is pulling some of that nutrients and the, the soil pigmentation out of it. So, yes, either one is fine. A mixture of both is fine. But you want to keep water to it and you want to keep nutrients to your plants. Another thing to keep in mind is that if you do have an apartment where you have a balcony or a deck, you want to... Um, hey, what's dripping on me down here? Well, you <laughs> want to keep that in mind, but you want to keep in mind the weight. Yes. So you might want to stick with five-gallon buckets mm -hmm. with the soil and then versus something like a terracotta um, or clay clay container because that's going to add more weight, especially if you also enjoy being on your balcony. Um, if you know that you do have neighbors below you, you want to be mindful that you're not dripping on them. But if you're, you know, watering in the afternoon or something or, you know, that they're not home, it's or you, fine. You can, you can get uh, a sled, one of them toboggans that have sides on it and put two or three of those in, in one of those, you know, and yeah. paint it up. Or there, there's many different creative ways in which you can set your containers in to capture the water so it's not dripping down and wasting, but it can absorb back in through the grow bag or the drainage holes in whatever device in, that you're using. Right. And one thing I also want to mention briefly and is that you can you can do the straw bale method. Yes. And a lot of people don't know about this method. You're basically taking a straw bale, you're conditioning it to so that you can grow plants in it. You're not just putting plants directly into a straw bale. You're conditioning it so it makes the bale into um, a, a container itself that will have the ability to host plants to let them root. And then you can use that as an option. And you might think, well, that's you know, maybe something I don't want to do and that's fine. You might think it's ugly or whatever, but it is an option as a container of sorts. Mm -hmm. So Holly, phylum bioproducts, they have products in which will fight grubs and beetles. Yes. Yeah, so if you want to control grub, beetle and grub invaders without affecting the rest of the ecosystem in your yard, then grub gone and beetle gone is the solution. Phylums, grub gone and beetle gone, beetle gone target a wide range of invasive and destructive beetles, weevils, borers without harming non targets such as bees, ladybugs, butterflies, earthworms or other beneficial insects. You can purchase these products locally in Massachusetts at Ward's Nursery and McHugh Garden Center in Hyannis. Country Garden in Connecticut at Van Wilgens Garden Center in Maine at Salisbury Organics and New York at Fadigan's Nursery and Ohio at Berlin Seeds. You can go to phylumbioproducts.com. You want to target the pests, not the rest. P phylumbioproducts.com, P-H-Y-L-L-O-M, bioproducts.com. And if you are a garden center nursery feed store and you want to carry phylum, you can reach out to phylum at phylum phylum bioproducts.com or right here at uh, the show at gardentalkradio at gmail.com and we will get you hooked up with them. Hang out with us when we come back. We're going to be talking about cooking in cast iron skillets and cast iron. You're tuned in to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Happy Leaf LED grow lights are USA made in small batches for outstanding performance and long run cost effectiveness. Five year warranty and VIP customer service. Grow happy at happyleafled.com. Use coupon code Joey Holly to get 10% off any order over $90 at happyleafled.com. 
Blue Ribbon Organics providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardeners, farms, landscaping, and more. To find our products nearest you, visit blueribbonorganics.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Are you bugged by bugs? You need naturally green products, no more bugs, environmentally friendly, made in the USA. No More Bugs is a cedar blend that repels and eliminates mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, roaches, ants, and more. No More Bugs is safe for you, your pets, and plants. Visit nomorebugs.net for free shipping on orders over $50. Use code FREESHIP for me. Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at dripworks.com. Deer Defeat is an all-natural based animal repellent to keep deer and rabbits away from your valuable plants that is odorless after 30 minutes and dries clear. It creates a continuous invisible shield to protect your plants. Works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Will not clog your sprayer. Apply to your property without environmental damage. You can spray directly onto your plants up to flowering, then apply around your plants to continue protection. No need to reapply. Money back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use coupon code RADIO to save 10% off your order. We know that you appreciate the value of a beautifully landscaped yard, but tackling such a project yourself can seem way too complicated, right? Bloomin' Easy Plants are the answer. Their plants are low maintenance and offer exceptional beauty and color for your yard. Plus, they offer free seasonal care reminders with simple how-to videos tailored to the plants that you choose. With Bloomin' Easy on your side, creating the yard that you've always wanted becomes as easy as plant, water, and relax. Check them out at your local garden center or by visiting bloominteasyplants.com. Mantis Tillers, the premium long-lasting gas-powered tillers, are the perfect solution for any garden. This Mantis machine is available with two or four cycle engines with a 19-inch or 16-inch tilling width. Your DIY companion in your garden and your lawn converts easily for edging, aerating, and more with optional attachments. Find details at mantis.com. Need a new mattress? Choose Furlo over the other leading brands and say big, really big. Because hey, nobody ever slept better for paying thousands more for basically the same mattress. Plus with Furlo Mattress, you also get our exclusive lifetime comfort guarantee. Good for as long as you own your mattress. Comfort to comfort, dollars to dollars. Compare Furlo to the others and it's obvious. You get more bed for your buck. Wake up. Sleep better. Verlo. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Aqua-Mart, Soil Savvy, Wind River Chimes, Wisconsin Greenhouse Company, Pro Plugger, Deer Defeat, Dripping Springs Oyas, Phylum Bioproducts. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. We're going to talk about cooking and cast iron but first a word from our good friends at rise gardens rise gardens is a revolutionary hydroponic gardening system for your home instead of food traveling hundreds or even over a thousand miles before it hits your plates harvest the veggies herbs and greens you need for dinner tonight in the comfort of your home no green thumb required gardening made easy with the rise gardens app step-by-step guidance from seed to harvest a complete garden on a shelf Comes with everything you need to grow healthy and the freshest food for you and your loved ones. Fully customize your garden to your needs and preferences. For more information and get your Rise Garden, visit risegardens.com. Well, whenever you harvest your food from your garden, one may choose to cook it in a variety of different types of devices. However, we are going to talk about cooking in cast iron. So there's many benefits to cooking in cast iron. And I think one that people don't always think about, they might think, oh, it's so heavy, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's it's just a pain. But it does regulate the heat very evenly once it gets warmed up. And that's important because 
I've had cheaper pans that are nonstick, and then you know you get this hot spot on the side or in the middle. And inconsistent then, cooking. Inconsistent cooking. Yeah. Uh-huh. And another thing that is nice about the cast iron is they can easily go from stove to oven, and that's that's nice too. Right. It's it, uh, there's no worry about that whatsoever. But yeah, it holds that heat and holds it very well. Whether you're cooking on the stove, on a camp stove, or over a campfire, uh, we use cast iron cookware when we go camping. We have an additional channel called Time by the Tent on YouTube in which we document our camping adventures as well as camping tips and um, everything in between when it comes to camping. So we use cast iron because of the unique aspect that it provides with the meals in which you prepare in which you cannot capture in any other way. It is also, though it is heavy, it is easy to clean and easy to maintain. If done correctly, your cast iron skillet, if, again, done correctly, over the course of multiple cookings, can essentially work into becoming a nonstick skillet. Just like your Teflon that you uh, are using or may choose to use. Some people choose not to use because of the toxicity in which they feel is aroma, is going into the food. But cast iron can layer in. It's a, it's a way of, of, of becoming a non-stick skillet based on how you're cooking with it. Right. It's, um, it's an option for that. And they do make uh, the thinner cast iron. So maybe if you're just doing some simple cooking where you don't need the sides the deeper sides of the pan more like a flat pan like a flat yeah, pan yeah. that's something that might be a little bit more manageable for you if you're especially if you're just two people we have a i think it's like an eight inch or ten inch skillet eight inch yeah yeah and we use that for a lot of things and it's it's not too heavy to deal with um it it, it will la- <clears throat> it will last forever uh so you i mean you with with the thin with you get what you pay for when it comes to cast iron. There are a, there's a handful of American-made companies that still produce cast iron in the United States. There are many knockoffs and other over, overseas manufacturers that produce lower quality, thinner cast iron. And you can tell just by looking at a cast iron skillet if it is thick or thinned walled and the thicker walls distribute that heat better. And you don't want to put a cast iron anything into a dishwasher or scrub it heavily with soap. Most recommendations are simply wipe it out. If you do have uh, residue left from whatever you're cooking, you can take and put some soapy water into it, scrub it with a soft bristled brush, and then rinse it out and dry it immediately. Some people will also turn the stove on and flip it upside down over the stove to get the rest of that water out before they put it away. There are ways of treating a cast iron or seasoning it if it is not already seasoned or it loses its seasoning because you forgot to do something or it became rusty. There's many different mechanisms and and techniques in which you can do that uh, when doing that. So I've taken completely rusty cast iron and used it with a vinegar spray rinsed it off, vinegar spray, and then seasoned it with olive oil in a 500-degree oven over the course of a three-hour period, and it has come out looking as if it, we bought it from the store. So yeah, it can so be you done. Can, you can find how to do this um, on the on the, on the the interwebs uh, online, but Joey did find that way to, to use the vinegar and then the, the neutral oil. We use olive oil to season it and I he does this when I'm not home because I don't want to smell the um the very strong odor of the the pan getting seasoned essentially you can do this over a campfire too yeah and we also discovered that after it's been seasoned and you do cook with it um it can have kind of an odor a strong odor so if you if you are using cast iron for camping and you want you found a piece at a thrift store, secondhand shop, whatever, and you want to season it, you can season it in your home and then maybe you do want to cook with it over a campfire or grill outside, whatever, to to get that initial cooking just in case there is some something to still kind of burn off. 
Yes. Um, cast iron is something that has been around for a long time. It'll be around for a much longer time than you are if you take care of the pan. Uh, there's Dutch ovens. There's frying pans that are four inches, and I've seen them up to, I think, 24 inches uh, in diameter. And they are very hefty. And you can make cornbread bread or any type of uh, basically anything you make with anything else you can do in a cast iron uh, the big thing is doing uh, bread in a ca- in a Dutch oven that, that's a popular thing as well yeah there's the bread in the Dutch oven there's um, pizza in the cast iron a lot of people make the deep mm-hmm. dish pizza so you get that crispy crust on the outside the soft chewy crust in the middle and then the nice delicious cheesy pizza i'm not a huge fan of deep dish but that does when i've seen people do that it does look delicious and and there's grilled cast iron that's got the grill marks on it so you can have the uh the appeal to your burger or meat that has the grill marks that that's uh something that we're working on learning more about in um And I just found another pan the other day that uh, allows that. There is cast iron waffle makers. There's cast iron anything that you can imagine. They've made it out of cast iron. Um, Pudgy pie. I don't. I don't know. That maybe probably. I don't know. It's kind of. Yeah, I think. I think so. You the handle might not be all cast iron, but the the little like clampy sandwichy part. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, cast iron is a very unique thing. Now, when it comes to cooking things in which you've harvested, there's really no wrong way to go about doing it. Yes, you can, and it's recommended to use some oil or butter in order to uh, add some lubrication to the bottom of the pan to prevent your vegetables from sticking or your meat from sticking in the bottom of the pan. I will have to say... Yes. I personally don't cook that much of the cast iron. Joey does. Is there a reason of, why you choose not to? I just think it's it's a little bit different for me. I'm used to to the lighter weight, um, I hate to say it, nonstick Teflon uh-huh. pan. But I, I do enjoy what you cook. But in. they do have nonstick coatings for cast iron. Some of the major companies do have that, that white coating inside of them that's almost essentially yeah. nonstick. Right. I'm not saying that it's the nonstick. I'm just saying that it's it's just a matter of what I'm used to cooking in. And I feel like you, since you how you grew up uh-huh. with deer camp and farming and blah, 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 it's more, it's more your style. Um, but I have nothing against it. And then when we go camping, you do most of the cooking and then I do a lot of the food prep and stuff. So, um, it's just something that I'm not familiar, I guess, with, or it's just not second nature to me. Now, there are good quality pans in which you can get for 20 or $30, $40. You can also spend hundreds of dollars on cast iron. There is uh, some, you know companies that no longer exist that are people will look for specific brands or in embro- uh, brand markings on pans that uh, are good and some people simply collect them to collect them like people collect radios or cars or or uh, golf clubs but there are a certain caliber of individual that that's all they use is cast iron maybe Maybe we should talk about cast iron accessories. Yes. So, like, for example, our cast iron set that we got came with that glove, the heat glove. A heat glove. And, like, a hooky thing. Uh, uh, to remove the lid off yeah. the cast iron. Now, mm-hmm. we got a cook set that's designed for outdoor cooking, which it is used for indoor as well. But it does come with a glove in which, because cast iron, there is no safe area on a cast iron. Whether you have a Dutch oven or you have a frying pan, it gets hot everywhere and it stays hot for a very long time if it's good quality so you have to be very cautious of how and where you lift it and put it once you're done making the dish that you're making right and those are nice and then you can you'll see a lot of times if you go to the store that sells cast iron i've even seen this at big box stores that sell cast iron um, there's like a little scrubber chain chain link, or whatever it's called. It chain looks mail. it look yeah it looks like a handful of it looks like a wad of dog chain but very tightly woven that is used to scour the bottom of the cast iron because it is not it, it's 
frowned upon to use steel wool on a cast iron because you can break apart or remove that seasoning that is being layered into the bottom of the pan that over time creates that non-stick layer, that natural non-stick layer on the pan. So there are accessories in which if you're going to do it and you want to do it more right than others, you can spend additional funds on getting the correct um, additional accessories in order to properly clean the pan in which you're um, cooking in. Right. And that's, that's again, another accessory. And if you are not familiar with cooking in cast iron, I would suggest investing if you want to if you want to start cooking invest in a piece uh something that you know that you will use i don't want to call it multi-purpose but multi-purpose yeah yes um piece that you're like okay i use a 12 inch skillet now for a lot of my cooking i will invest in a 12 inch skillet for cast iron cooking and then get used to that that switch i know for us we uh, part of our cast iron outdoor cooking set we got a nice dutch oven and i didn't get a chance to use it last year while camping and i'm looking forward to it and uh, they have griddles and uh the they have griddles in which you can use. So cast iron, whether you cook uh, only vegetarian dishes and or you cook carnivore dishes or both, um, cast iron is a way to go. It is a healthier way to go than what a lot of the mm, devices in which you could choose to cook in. Nowadays, uh, The there's a level of mindset safety piece of mind that cast iron offers because it is a very authentic and earth friendly i guess healthy for one to use right yep so i think you should give it a try so when we come back we're gonna have it's your time for garden questions and garden answers you're tuned in to the garden with joy and holly radio show have a garden question Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. Head into Fleet Farm where you'll find everything you need. From tires to tree stands, drills to dog food, toys to tools, they've got it all. You can save even more at Fleet Farm when you join the Fleet Rewards Loyalty Program. You get exclusive offers and it's free to sign up. Get everything you need at a low fleet price. Shop in store or online today at Fleet Farm. Dripping Springs Oyas. Clay pot irrigation solves the watering needs for gardens, bushes, new trees, and more. An ancient irrigation system we brought to America. Dripping Springs Oyas. O-L-L-A-S. On YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Check us out. Garden like a pro in three easy steps and receive customized fertilizer recommendations for your garden or lawn. Soil Savvy helps you determine what nutrients your plants need to thrive. Never again overapply nutrients they don't need. A patented process that makes you a smart gardener. To get your soil test kit, go to mysoilsavvy.com. Aqua-mart.com has everything you need for eye-pleasing outdoor water features on your property. For over 25 years, we've been creating and field testing beautiful water features in order to provide you with the most reliable products and best value in the industry. From easy to install pond and water fill kits to pumps, fish food, and more, you'll find everything you need to install and maintain a naturally balanced water feature in your yard. Make your backyard a true oasis and maintain it well. Visit aqua-mart.com to shop for all your needs. Ah, spring, the season of renewal, an unexpected house guest, none the worse perhaps than ants. And I'm not talking about great Aunt Mabel. When you need to get rid of ants fast, you need Rescue Ant Baits. Rescue Ant Baits are pre-baited, child-resistant, and ready to use right out of the box. No sticky liquid, no mess. Made in the USA by the makers of the popular Rescue Fly and Yellow Jacket Traps. Learn more at rescue.com. That's R-E-S-C-U-E dot C-O-M. Overwatering is the top reason why houseplants are dying. Tree Diaper solves this problem by absorbing excess water up from the soil. It will store water and use it when the soil dries. Use Garden 15 to save 15% at treediaper.com. Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Dripworks, Rise Gardens, Grip 6, Bloomin' Easy, Fleet Farm, Waltons Incorporated, Blue Ribbon Organics, Tree Diaper. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. 
Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Happy you've been with us today. It's time for Garden Questions and Answers. you got a question, we've got an answer for you. You can send that over via GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. That's GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Or if you'd like to give us a call, you can certainly do that as well by dialing us up toll-free coast-to-coast at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. And a number of questions come in. We're going to see what we can get through to the top of the hour, Holly. So this this question is sponsored by Fleet Farm and FleetFarm.com. How many feet is suggested between raised beds? So how far apart should I space them? Well, if you have ample, plenty of space for your raised beds, three foot is recommended because it will allow you to be able to mow preferably probably with a push mower, uh, four foot if you are wanting to use a riding mower, and that three foot plus will give you the accessibility to get wheelbarrows and wagons and carts down through the raised beds. If you are limited on space and you don't see the need of a wheelbarrow being a necessity in order to fill or maintain the beds, two foot will work, but it does get quite cramped in the um, in the backyard when you're trying to walk around the raised beds right absolutely so you want to think about how how you maintain your yard also so that's that's something Uh, as much as it may hurt to lose a raised bed area that extra foot per space between raised beds you know if you got five or six or seven raised beds makes a very very big difference in the less of hassle in which it takes to maintain around the beds. Right. And then the the follow-up question that is, how important is it to level the beds when you set them up? It's not that important at all. Uh, If you're growing in the ground and the ground is slightly tilted or, or, you know, slanted towards the east or the west, you're not going to fix that. If the beds, if you feel that the aesthetics of the beds need to be somewhat level, then you can jack the corner up and and maneuver the the means around in order to get the beds at, at a level height. But it makes no difference. The plants will grow whether the beds are level or not. The plants will grow whether you get them in a straight row or not. So it doesn't make a difference. Um, I know that there are certain cultures where they carve out certain areas along the side of hills or mountains and they grow that way, stair step it up the up the cliff. But for your backyard, front yard, if it's a two inches higher in one end versus one inch lower on the other, it's not going to make a difference. Only if it bothers you, if it bothers you, then you probably should fix it because it's going to bother you for the rest of the time that you had those raised beds on your property. All right. I am using grow bags for my potatoes. Do I need to put wood or bricks under them or when I place them on the uh, in the backyard or a pallet or can I just put them right on the ground? You can put them just right on the ground. That's not a problem. Okay. You you if you want to put them on bricks or wood or a pallet or some sort of uh, support underneath, you certainly can. But we've grown plenty of things and grow bags just on the ground. Right. Now, we don't care about our grass. If you care about your grass, then you would want to elevate them on a pallet or some type of uh, shelving unit in which would elevate them. Because when you put them on the ground and you grow in them 60-gallon, 30-gallon, 15, 10, 8 for the entire season, that grass is pretty much not coming back because you have killed that grass in its entirety. You've got spots there. Yeah, but if you put them even, if you put bricks down, the bricks are going to kill the grass. Right. Yeah, but I, yeah, I guess so. So you, you don't, and, and I, I, I mean, this person didn't indicate whether they were concerned about the grass or not, but you can put them right on the ground. That's not going to hurt anything whatsoever. Is it possible to grow a pumpkin in a container? We've done this. We we have done this. Now, it wasn't your state fair winning 600-pound pumpkin. It, I think it was like a two-pound pumpkin, Cinderella pumpkin, I think is what it was. This was like eight, nine years ago. We grew it in a, in a 15-gallon plastic mimicking a terracotta pot. And in order to do that, I mean, we it, pumpkins need a lot of water. So in a means of experimental process, as the pumpkin grew, 
we, I believe it was that or the zucchini, we took sand and put about one inch of sand around the top as a mulch. And the reason why we did that was when you go to the beach and you look at the sand, the sand is dry. When you move it back, the top few half inch or so or inch of so of sand at the beach, what is it? It's wet. Moisture retains, the sand retains moisture. It may not be something you can grow in, but it's something that you can use as a mulch to hold the moisture from wicking out of the soil and it worked and we got like a two pound pumpkin i think we've got it on video somewhere on our parent uh youtube channel the wisconsin vegetable gardener um and if you go to our parent website the wisconsin vegetable and in the search bar put in pumpkins and containers i think that'll come up but uh, yeah it will work you can do it much better than what we did um you can use a grow bag from root maker a 60 gallon grow bag and use put one plant in it and now a pumpkin now keep this in mind pumpkins watermelons any of those very viney crops they can take in upwards of 30 to 50 square feet to grow just a couple of pumpkins just a couple of fruit so it's not something that is going oh i can just keep it in this corner of the of the yard uh ollie your sister she grew uh we grew uh jardel pumpkins yeah. and spaghetti squash and butternut squash uh, many years ago in her backyard and she didn't have a backyard for most of the season because it kept encroaching throughout the yard and it was about 70 square feet that was used up just for those plants so it can be done uh but anything you just think about and the they, end product what, what what's the end product the pumpkin no no i mean the, the how much space that in because people will often plant tomatoes or peppers real close because they're oh they're, we'll just plant them, plant them six inches apart they grow so you need to plant them two to three foot apart so when, at the final time they are growing slightly together in a hedge and they're not competing with each other because they're too close right but what i'm saying is that, that yeah you want the pumpkin but also when they do vine out like that they kind of root down a little yeah, bit. yeah they do have yeah yeah, uh, uh, feeder roots yeah. on the plant okay so you can't yeah. you can't just like necessarily shift the roots because you're going to uproot or disturb or yeah. damage and these are very sensitive vines to begin with right i mean you look at them wrong they crack on you so yeah is it let's see i do not want to have leggy seedlings again like i did last year how do i prevent that from happening first of all what is a, a leggy plant letting leggy seedling huh, uh, holly it's a plant that's grown very tall but with few leaves okay so you'll often see this if you have when you have seedlings and maybe they don't have access to enough light that's close to them, um, that's typically the reason why. But sometimes some plants are just naturally leggy. Well, Happy Leaf LED uh, grow lights use coupon code Joey Holly to save 10% on orders over $90. They are American made light that provides ample and excessive uh, over amount of light required for the plant. So you don't have that problem. So proper amount of light, proper amount of water. And if you are using a heat mat in order to warm the soil to get them to germinate, when they germinate, Holly, you got to pull that heat mat off. Otherwise that can contribute to legginess. Now there are plants such as brassicas, that naturally have the tendency to be more leggy than tomatoes or eggplants or peppers. So keep that in mind. Just because it may look leggy, that might be some of the characteristics of Brussels sprouts or kale or cabbage. So you just kind of have to work with that in uh, the means that you, you have for that. So it, it can happen for just plants to be leggy to begin with. Okay. All right, so some this person is seeking suggestions for a low acid cherry tomato variety. Okay, typically the rule of thumb is if you want a less acidic or acid tomato, cherry or beefsteak, you want to go with a non-red variety. They typically, now to all tomatoes are going to have some level of acidity. But if you go with a, a non-red one, that's going to give you a little less Acidity. So here's some here's some suggestions here. Yep. So you can get varieties such as Ace. Um, there's like an Ace 55 variety, Amish Paste, Big Girl, Fireball, San Marzano. Um, those are all low acid selections. As far as the cherry tomato variety, there's not really a low acid cherry tomato. Right. Yeah. So Le less acid, but not low acid. Right. Yeah. Um, so those are varieties that you want to, to look at to 
to grow for for low acid. Well, Holly, that will do it. We are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Did you miss any portion of the program today or would like to revisit it? You can certainly do that by going to your favorite search engine and searching the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show, or you can go to our parent website, which is thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, and clicking on the Radio 7 tab at the top of the page, or send us an email, gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and we'll send you a link to the program, and we'll answer your questions that come in. You uh, Check out the program next week. Do not miss it. We will be talking talking about planting tomatoes as well as spring soil preparation what you should do and not do and our guest is garden talk radio host and author doug oster so until next week for hi baird i'm joy baird and we will see you in the garden (laughs) 